Hello and welcome to Rotted Reviews, and welcome back to my hidden treasure picks. All through this month, I'm foregoing traditional reviews and instead putting a focus on shining a spotlight on movies I think are undeservedly underseen. No scores assigned, just unearthing cinematic treasures and trying to get more souls across the world aware of their existence. Today's video is devoted to my Rotted Requester patrons. I assigned them this task to name any movie in the world, horror or not, that they feel deserves to be seen more and a quick summary of why that pick in particular. While these picks aren't mine specifically, I did go ahead and watch all of these and am now willing to step up to the bat and advocate for these films on behalf of my loyal patrons. Let's have at it. The movie that Ben Grimm requested is the 2011 South London film Attack the Block. Written and directed by Joe Cornish and starring John Boyega, Jodie Whittaker, and Nick Frost, Ben said he picked this one because it's an under-talked-about sci-fi movie that I consider horror. Great creature effects for the aliens, a future Doctor Who and Finn from Star Wars on the cast, Nick Frost casually being hilarious, and a great cast of kids, and yet hardly anyone knows it exists. Honestly, I didn't even know this movie existed until it popped up for a watch party on another channel I support on Patreon a few years back. And Ben, I've loved it ever since. Following a group of residents living in the South London apartment complex they refer to as The Block, danger literally falls from the sky when they are suddenly finding themselves surrounded by alien creatures with vanta black fur and glowing teeth, ready to make a quick meal out of anyone they happen to come across. This is a film that is simple in concept, but elevated greatly by well-thought-out details. The characters are rich and vibrant, existing within their microcosm and providing it with a spirit and life that makes the block something to defend and protect. And like Ben mentioned, the creature effects are fantastic and original. From what I've read, as little CGI as possible was used here and was mostly employed to clean up some scenes and creature details, but for the most part, they employed practical effects as much as possible, which influenced the performances a great deal. I do think that there is something to be said for having actors react in real time to tangible threats that are actually standing right in front of them, robotic actuators moving teeth and providing a menacing visual to play off of. Some of the language can be a bit jarring, and if you're not used to thick accents, it might be best to watch this one with the subtitles on as a supplemental reference point. But honestly, that also sells the character and setting. Everything about Attack the Block is unique in the space it occupies, especially for what could have easily been a worn out and forgettable aliens attack type movie. Straying from the horror genre, Jackie's recommendation for this video is the 1971 Walter Matthau comedy, A New Leaf. According to Jackie, might be my favorite rom-com and nobody knows about it. Based on the Jack Ritchie short story, The Green Heart, this was written for the screen and directed by Elaine May and stars Walter Matthau as Henry Graham, a spoiled brat of an aging bachelor that has enjoyed a life of wealth and privilege until his excessive spending finally catches up to him and his accountant informs him that he's broke. Rather than liquidate his remaining assets, investing wisely and living within a modest means, he instead refuses to give up his grandiose way of living and instead decides the best course of action is to marry a wealthy woman, after which, not willing to give up his independence, he'll plan on murdering her and make it look like an accident. So the hunt is on! He only has a limited time window to execute his plan and his bride before the last check is called in and he finds himself truly destitute. If you're looking for raucous, laugh-out-loud, humorous situations akin to the hijinks of Airplane, it would be best to look elsewhere. The humor of A New Leaf is born from dry-as-a-bone wit and the obnoxiousness of the characters interacting with one another 99% of the time about as well as oil and water. Matthau's performance of the easy-to-hate Graham was pitch perfect, but equally as good was Elaine May playing Henrietta Lowell, a shy, clumsy botany professor that becomes the rested target of Graham's affections and malfeasance. I couldn't help but feel like, with the quirky and subdued aspect of the humor and situations, I was watching a movie that could prove to be an influence decades down the line to a young Wes Anderson in writing style at the very least. I think I enjoy romantic comedies more than many others in my demographic would be willing to admit and A New Leaf proved to be one that stood alone in its unique oddities. 
For a genre that can be argued often follows the same old tired formula over and over again, this film breaks that mold and I kind of loved it for that. I don't know if I can say it was my favorite, but I can safely say I enjoyed it and I won't soon forget A New Leaf. Thank you, Jackie. This was a wonderful watch. Heading back into the horror world, but still keeping the same subtle nuance, I find myself facing the movie coming from Nikki, who wanted me to talk about the 1977 movie Audrey Rose. Nikki says, in the spirit of highlighting films that are overlooked in the supernatural genre, this film, I feel, isn't given the credit it deserves. I watched it when I was a young teenager with my mom, so nostalgia is high. It affected me enough to do some digging, and I learned it was from a book, which I read and highly recommend, but that book stemmed from a real incarnation event the author had himself. It isn't a high-octane riot or full of gore and not full of jump scares, but it is intriguing and, in my view, well-acted. It has stayed with me since I watched it, and I feel other fans fans of horror supernatural movies should get to see it too. So I went ahead and checked this movie out, directed by legend Robert Wise, who also directed The Day the Earth Stood Still, The Sound of Music, and of course, the 1963 classic, The Haunting. This film is indeed based on the book of the same name written by Frank De Felita, starring John Beck, Marsha Mason, and the indomitable Anthony Hopkins, Audrey Rose tells the tale of an idyllic family living in New York City, Janice, her husband Bill, and their young daughter of Ivy. Their picture-perfect life starts to find shaky ground when they notice a mysterious man following them, never really engaging, just there, on the subway, in the elevator, waiting outside of Ivy's school. After several good moments of tension, the silence finally gets broken as they take a meeting with this man who introduces himself as Elliot Hoover. Elliot goes on to say that a number of years ago, he lost his wife and five-year-old daughter, Audrey Rose, in an automobile accident where they both burned to death. Elliot presents himself well enough, polite and cordial, even apologizing for disturbing them, but he wanted to observe before engaging. What was he observing? He believes that the soul of Audrey Rose now resides in Ivy, buried, and only emerging in the form of sleepwalking nightmares Ivy suffers from periodically. The traditional spook and scare method is shelved in this film, favoring a softer and more nuanced tone of character study. Audrey Rose asks a lot of questions and uses the Templeton family and Elliot to not necessarily answer them, but try to navigate these uncharted waters while searching for their meaning. The concept of reincarnation is weighed heavily as a philosophical study more than a jump scare opportunity. This is a film built on a foundation of dialogue and weighty, if sometimes a bit repetitive, high emotion performances. Like Nikki said, this is not a high octane ride. And though that's not everybody's cup of tea, it's hardly a criticism in my eyes. I love a good carnival ride or even a roller coaster of a horror movie. But I also enjoy the thoughtful films that beg introspection, examination of moral gray areas, and quiet contemplation. Hopkins, unsurprisingly, delivers the best performance in the movie, offering a sympathetic visage to a character that could easily have been seen as nothing more than a manipulative flim-flam man. Robert Wise employed some of his famous improv narrative in this film, scrapping some of the two character interactions previously written and instead letting the actors play out the scene in whatever way they felt while recording the audio of them performing their improvised speech, then writing that into the scene when shooting actually began. I'm not going to make the claim that this is better or worse than a standard screenplay method, but it does add a unique sense of natural interaction to some scenes. I'm glad I got the chance to watch this film that certainly went under my radar until Nikki pointed it out, and I'm equally glad to be highlighting it in this video for you to consider checking out 1977's Audrey Rose. The fourth movie of the five I'll be talking about today comes at the request of Catherine, who requested the 2013 movie directed by James Ward Burkett, Coherence. Accompanying this pick was also the request that I watch this movie prior to learning anything at all about it whatsoever, and only afterward look into how it was shot. Having never seen this film and knowing nothing about it ahead of time, I fulfilled this request to the letter, and I gotta say, that was some great advice. However, not wishing to spoil either this movie or that same experience for everyone else, I find myself in a little bit of a verbal challenge, but I will attempt to navigate these waters and hopefully compel some new watchers without taking anything away from the experience. I admire collaborative efforts in arts, sciences, and just about every humankind endeavor to do a whole lot 
with very little. In a world of runaway budgets, filming actors surrounded by green floors, walls, and ceilings, looking at simple single location productions made on a budget approximately the same cost of a 2008 Volkswagen sedan, I find myself astounded at just how compelling coherence managed to be. Taking place at a dinner party with a group of lifelong friends that happen to take place while a comet is passing Earth at a record close distance, we have a mishmash of entangled relationships and personalities that come to show true strain when strange events begin surrounding them. That's really about as much of the plot as I feel comfortable discussing. Really, I just have to dance in a long-winded fashion around coming to the same conclusion and request of Catherine. Don't look up anything. Watch this film then see how they made it. For the simplicity of the mechanics Coherence employs, make no mistake, this is not a simple story. This is a high-level concept that continually kept me on my toes. Although lacking in perhaps the painful meticulousness of the film Primer, I couldn't help but draw parallels in how high-level concepts don't need billion-dollar budgets and 200-person VFX teams. Sometimes it just takes a creative vision at the right place and the right time. The last movie the requesters put forward comes to us from Tuan, who wanted me to showcase the 2000 film starring John Malkovich and Willem Dafoe, Shadow of the Vampire. Written by Stephen Katz and directed by E. Elias Merhej, I did actually do a review of this movie not too long ago, and I agree that although this is likely the most well-known film in this list, I do think it should be on more people's radar, and it does deserve to be seen more than it has. Taking a fictional retelling of the production of the 1922 Frederick Murnau classic film Nosferatu, this movie leans into the long-held rumor that Max Schreck, who played the titular role, was himself a vampire. In this case, John Malkovich plays director Murnau and Willem Dafoe slams home a breathtaking performance as Max Schreck. Also starring a fantastic cast including Udo Kier, Carrie Elwes, and Eddie Izzard, Shadow of the Vampire is a movie that dabbles in many different styles, reveling in the historical accuracy of 1922 filmmaking, while also taking big leaps of playful fiction and even injecting some great humor and heart into these characters. When Tuan requested this, he said of Shadow of the Vampire, the atmosphere, acting, and makeup work are immaculate. Very creepy homage to Nosferatu, I think, good movie. Man, I have to agree with that. If vampire movies aren't really your thing, believe me, I get it. They're kind of standing right alongside zombies for me as a symbol of horror I recognize for its significance, but have largely spread themselves too thin and are in desperate need of respite. However, even if I'm weary of a particular class of monster, I can't help but love the foundations of horror even just on an academic level. So I have found myself over the last few months watching the 1922 Nosferatu and the 1979 Werner Herzog Nosferatu the Vampire. And in that, I feel like I have a solid foundation in which to appreciate the satirical take detailing the troubled film set of that silent classic as a real vampire pretends for the camera while continuing to feast on the crew. So there we have it, five requesters and their five picks for movies that need to be seen by more people. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope the remainder of your October goes swimmingly. <laughs> thank you for watching, I really do appreciate it and thank you for your support by liking, subscribing and clicking on that notification bell. Get informed when new videos of mine drop. Take care and remember next time you wanna watch a horror movie, first make sure that it's good and rotted.